what triggered this bizarre behavior. Journey into the cold heart of northern darkness with Nordic crimes. That case uh, became like a scene from a horror movie. A new true crime documentary series that chilled the bone. The hunger for killing is increasing in the course of these homicides. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Nordic Crimes is a part of the Acast family. Welcome to mini episode 331 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And I have two spooky stories for you today. And the last story comes from December the 13th, 2023. And just to let everybody know, I know last week I said the 9th of December, 1989. It's because it's my date of birth. So when I saw the 9th of December, I automatically slipped into 9th of December, 1989 rather than 2023. That's that's why. That's what happened. And story number one today comes from Donna. After listening to episode 218, The Warminster Thing, I felt compelled to write to you with this story. I had actually been working on sending it to you for some time, but I'm a great procrastinator, so I hadn't gotten around to it yet. This happened in 1972 or 1973. I think it was summer or spring, but I can't recall the exact date. My twin sister and I were riding bikes at our elementary school after school hours. We were 9 or 10 years old at the time, but we were allowed to do whatever we wanted outside of the house, as long as we told our mom where we were going and got home by dinner. It was in the days of the free-range child. We were riding on the blacktop which was between the school's parking lot and baseball field, so there was lots of open sky around us. Looking due east over the trees along the farthest edge of the school, we could see a blimp travelling straight towards us. We'd seen blimps before, but a sighting was rare, so we thought it was cool. We watched it for several minutes. It was moving very slowly and taking a long time to get to us. Ultimately, it did reach the school and seemed to be heading towards our neighbourhood, so we decided to see where it was going. We started to bike back home using a path through the woods, and it floated silently above the trees along with us. I recall crossing the middle school football field, which was right next to the elementary school, then riding through a stand of pine trees to an opening in a tall chain-link fence that stood at the edge of the school property. A wide gravel drive on the other side of the opening was connected to the street that we lived on. The entire time we were riding home, it was following above us. We'd been riding as fast as we could on our stingrays, and the blimp was keeping the same pace, so approximately 10 miles per hour. By the time we got to our street, this thing was directly over the top of us, probably no more than a hundred feet above us. I could feel how huge it was. I looked up to try and figure out what company it belonged to. What I saw was a long, cigar-shaped object, which I estimate to have been about 150 feet long and 50 feet wide. The colour was either white or a dull grey. The texture was possibly metallic but not shiny. There were absolutely no markings on it, no letters, numbers, logos or icons of any sort. There were also no visible structural elements such as seams, ribs, rivets or bolts and no wires or rigging were attached to it. There was no tail or rudder, no wings, no motor or propeller and no gondola. It seemed to be completely self-contained, like an elongated opaque soap bubble. I'm not a blimp expert, but even as a kid I knew that people would need to be housed somewhere in it where they could operate it. And they also needed some way to operate it. There wasn't anywhere for people to be, so there couldn't be any people in it. I suddenly realised that there was no way this could just be a blimp. As this fact took hold in my mind, we had just reached our house. We rode up the driveway and stopped at the sidewalk not chasing it any longer. I wasn't really frightened, just very unnerved. 
We watched as it continued on its way for as long as we could see it, still heading in the same westerly direction, silently and slowly gliding just above the trees. I don't recall telling my parents or our other siblings, or if I talked about it at school. If I had, I feel sure it would have been discounted as a blimp. After a while, my mind just put it aside. I didn't entirely forget that it had happened, but I didn't think about it for many years. It wasn't really until I started dating my future husband that I remembered the event. It was 1979 and we were in high school and had just started dating. As one does when getting to know someone, we started telling stories about unusual things we had experienced or heard of. He decided to tell me about one of the strangest things that he had ever seen. It was about 1972 or 1973 and he had just ridden his bike up to the top of the hill on the street that he lived on, which coincidentally was east of and about a mile away from my house as the crow flies. He was sitting on his bike and was looking across the main road at a farm that was there at the time. The farm had a very large open field where cattle sometimes grazed. At the back of the field was a dense stand of trees that backed up to a neighbourhood, the neighbourhood next to my elementary school. At the far end of the field, he saw a strange blimp-like object that was hovering in front of and slightly below the tops of the trees. It was angled so that he saw a three-quarter view of it. The description he gave of this thing was nearly identical to what I had seen. It just floated there, almost motionless above the field. He watched it for a while and actually got bored because it wasn't doing anything. Unable to figure out what he was looking at, he ultimately turned his bike around and rode back to the house. When he told me this story, my own story immediately came to mind and I told him about it. We were both convinced that we had seen the same thing. My theory is that at some point after he rode home, the object rose above the trees and floated towards the school where I was riding bikes with my twin sister. I can't prove that but it seems too coincidental to not be the same event. The abiding question I have is, what was it? I know it was not a blimp based on my observations about the lack of a gondola, etc. The technology didn't exist for a drone that large and without an obvious means of propulsion. I also don't think it was a weather balloon. It was flying in a horizontal direction straight and very slowly, Weather balloons typically fly vertically unless they are crashing, in which case they might fly horizontally, but they would move erratically and would not stay up for so long. Was it some advanced human technology that we still don't know about today, or was it something else? Trying to find out what it was that I saw is the biggest reason I started listening to paranormal podcasts. When I listened to your Warminster Thing episode and heard that a cigar-shaped object was seen hovering in place for 20 minutes over southwest England in 1965, I was immediately intrigued and wondered if there was any connection to what we saw in the early 1970s in central Virginia. If so, it could imply that there was a much larger scope to these sightings. Donna, you've officially given me the ick on this beautiful sunny morning it's not actually sunny I don't know why I said that it's actually quite overcast and cloudy but you've given me the ick and in the world of UFO sightings and UFO experiences huge cigar shaped objects in the sky are are annoyingly not that not that uncommon so I think it I think it's probably realistic that you and your boyfriend saw the same thing which is I think really weird really coincidental And I think it's very likely that other people in other parts of the world have seen the same thing. Like, for example, the Warminster thing. People saw a big cigar shaped object sort of floating in the sky. I think one of the key characteristics of these cigar shaped objects or these UFOs is that they're silent and smooth. And I'm always in two minds about these things. I mean, we know that for a period of time, maybe in the 70s and 80s, I spoke about it on one of the episodes that we did about the men in black I know that the government encouraged people to believe that the things that they saw were UFOs, right? Because they were like, yes, UFOs, definitely not anything to do with us, the military. No, no. So people definitely were seeing things in the sky that they didn't know what they were because they'd never seen technology like that before. And for a period of time, of course, it was military tech. And I think that sometimes it probably is still military tech. However, however, 
there have been so many incidences of people seeing things for example you've got uh, military officials seeing things that they're like whoa we've seen this ufo this unidentified flying object this unidentified aerial phenomena we've seen it and we don't know what it is and they're all excited about it we've all heard the footage where they're where they're excited about seeing these objects and trying to figure out what they are which would imply to me that that they're not at least military from america or the uk these objects i think a huge cylindrical object that has no rivets doesn't seem to have any screws holding everything together doesn't seem to have a method of propulsion doesn't seem to have anywhere for a crew to be where you know where in a blimp you have a basket as such that a crew would be in i think if that level of military tech was bopping around in the 70s surely we would be seeing it now or at least seeing a version of it i don't know what people are seeing when they're seeing these ufos or these unidentified aerial phenomenon i don't know what people are seeing but they're seeing something and maybe i'm naive but i can't really imagine the military use for a an aircraft that big and that slow i also think that if you were the military and you were secretly testing aircraft you would not be doing that in the middle of the day over central virginia I find that very, very disconcerting. This whole story has been very disconcerting, Donna. Just just so you know. Hey, everyone. I'm Craig Robinson, co-host of the Ways to Win podcast, alongside my good friend, John Calipari. I've been on the go recently. Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. And story number two comes from Holly. I've included three stories. The first two come from the 1998 book Where No Birds Sing, which is filled with short supernatural stories from throughout New Zealand. The last one is a commonly told story, probably one of this country's most well known. I have included additional information and correct pronunciation for some of the words. It is relatively common here to use words from Te Reo Maori in everyday conversations, which you will notice particularly in the second story. This story was told from a man who had lived on the west coast of the South Island. The view from their house was of an expansive beach. It was about 50 years ago it happened. We had a terrible storm out in the Tasman, the sea between New Zealand and Australia. The weather was the worst in living memory. In those days I was working for a timber milling company. For a week there had been no work in the bush. It wasn't just the rain, that was something we could handle, it was the wind. Trees and branches were coming down all over the place. Roofs had been ripped off. The power and telephone poles were down, it was a real mess. Mavis and I tied down everything on our property that could have blown away. We were lucky we didn't get the wind quite as badly as some houses closer to town. On the Saturday, I was told of a coastal ship that had capsized as it tried to get across the bar down at Greymouth. It was a local vessel that ran between Grey and Westport and around to Nelson, Picton and Wellington. I didn't know how many crew there had been, just that they had all drowned. There were a lot of tragedies on the coast in those days. There were always accidents in the mines and in the sawmilling. Since the storm had started about a week before, one of the local miners had been killed when his car was caught in a slip. Two young men from up the way had foolishly gone to lift a flounder net in a river lagoon and got tipped out of their dinghy by the wind. They drowned and their bodies had not been found. So it was a pretty glum gathering that Saturday night at the pub. Even the local policeman came in for the after-hour session which he never had before. I think the storm had just worn everyone out. I didn't stay long as Mavis was cooking a big meal and we were having the neighbours over. The storm had taken the roof off their kitchen and they were sort of camping in the rest of the house, cooking on the open fire in the living room. We decided they needed a good old-fashioned coast meal 
Bob and I picked up his wife June on our way home. We were walking of course, few of us had cars then. Anyway the three of us were dressed in our oil skins, all bent into the wind and the sea spray. June was only a little thing so Bob and I each had one of her arms to stop her being blown over. When we got close to our house the wind was not as bad, we could all stand up straight. Lucky you, said Bob, shaking his head. I thought yours would have been the first place to blow away. The air for a half mile back from the beach was as wet as a west coast drizzle. We had our dinner and a few hands of gin rummy and a beer and talked for a while about the storm, the shipwreck down at Greymouth and other things. Then Bob and June went off home. Mavis and I did the dishes and were about to get ready for bed when we realised the wind had stopped. For the first time in a week, a week and a half, it had stopped. And apart from the roaring of the sea, there was almost silence. I went out onto the porch and rolled a smoke. There was still spray in the air, but it was normal, not wind-driven. I could see the clouds, way up high, racing across the sky from Australia, heading towards South America. There was moonlight. It had been there before, no doubt, but the sea spray had meant we couldn't see it. Mavis came out and stood beside me. Want to take a walk and stretch the legs, I asked her. She shook her head. She wasn't keen, but she told me to go. I pulled on my coat and gum boots and let our old collie Ben out of the laundry, which had been his kennel since the big wind had begun. Out onto the beach we went. It was ten o'clock at night, I guess. The big waves were pounding in, but there was no wind. Old Ben was like a puppy running around all over the place. I suppose we walked for two miles, which was a short walk for us. I just didn't trust the weather and didn't want to be too far from home if the storm came crashing back. I was just about to turn back towards home when I saw some other people walking on the beach coming towards me from the south. The moon was quite bright, and I could see them reasonably clearly. There were seven of them, walking in a line abreast across the sand and shingle. There was a lot of driftwood lying on the beach, but they were just walking over it. I was surprised to see other people out on the beach at that hour. I mean, there were no houses that far down. Even on fine mornings and evenings when I'd take Ben for a walk, there would be no one out on the beach most times. I guess the seven were a hundred yards away when old Ben started to make a noise. It was a funny sound I'd never heard him make before. He was standing, staring down the beach at the approaching figures, and he was half snarling. He turned and looked at me, then back at them. Then he gave me a yip and turned and bolted back up the beach. He stopped a few yards further up and barked at me again. Ben had never been an aggressive dog, quite the opposite in fact. But here he was, baring his teeth and the hair around his neck was sort of like a lion's mane, all sticking out. I turned to look back at the figures coming towards us. They were closer, still walking stretched across the beach, still just sort of walking over the driftwood, not around it. Ben gave another yip and then he was off. I turned to watch him. He stopped a hundred yards further up and gave me a bark as if to say, Come on! Then he was off home like a bullet. I reached for my tobacco to roll a smoke. I figured I'd wait for these blokes. I could see they were blokes. They were close enough and the moon was bright enough for me to see their shapes quite plainly. They were all wearing oil skins and most had on sea boots. One wore what looked like a life jacket. They all had on caps or hats. I was halfway through rolling the smoke when I suddenly felt a shiver down my spine. I really shuddered and I spilled my tobacco. I knew right then and there that I didn't want to be where I was. I wasn't supposed to be where I was. I turned and started to walk quickly back up the beach. I looked back after a few paces and they were still coming on as they had been before, just stretched across the beach. I kept walking, dodging the huge piles of driftwood and kelp that had been thrown up by the storm. I looked back again a few yards further on. They were still coming. And then I saw something that made me want to run. Only a minute before, I had been forced to go around a huge tree trunk with roots still attached. One of the figures had just walked right through it. That did it for me. 
I cut off the beach to one of the many tracks that ran from the sand to the road through the dunes. I didn't really know if I was scared or just completely and utterly bewildered in some kind of shock. I got to the top of a sand dune and turned to look back. They were walking on as they had been. They had taken no notice whatsoever of me. I just stood there. The nearest figure was 50 or 60 yards away. The rest spread out from him down almost to where the waves foamed in. They were level with me. Then they were past and going away on up the beach. They seemed as solid as any people I had ever seen in my life. But as I watched, they just walked through the logs and piles of kelp and rubbish as if it wasn't there. None of them deviated one step. I didn't know what to do. Were they a threat? Whoever, whatever they were, should I run home along the road in case they left the beach and went to my house? I think the modern term for what I was experiencing is denial. I realised, of course, that if they were what my subconscious was telling me they were, which was impossible, of course, then there was nothing I could do. Also, my mind was arguing. Even if they were what I knew they couldn't possibly be, there was probably nothing to fear. Yes, that's how confused I was. I managed to fumble together the worst smoke I've probably ever rolled in my life, and eventually I got it going. I never took my eyes off them the whole time. They had been moving so quickly and relentlessly, I honestly don't think I could have stayed ahead of them on the sand or outrun them on the road. They were a long way up the beach when I suddenly decided I would go back down to the sand and follow them. It wasn't a decision made through bravery. Curiosity had by now overcome fear and even confusion. There was something I could do to prove or disprove what my subconscious was trying to tell me. I checked to see there was no one else walking up the beach. Then I went down to the sand and started after the seven figures. They were away in the distance, and I looked down at the sand where they had been. The only footprints in the patches of sand between the shingle banks and the storm debris were Ben's and mine. None of those seven sets of sea boots had left a mark. When I got back to the house, they were almost gone. The moon was fading because the wind was coming back and the spray was starting to cloud everything again. Ben was under the veranda and he was overjoyed to see me. I let him spend the rest of the night in the house. In bed later I told Mavis what I had seen. Now Mavis's mother was some sort of clairvoyant or something similar. I remember thinking it was strange when I first met Mavis and her family. Her mother did tea leaf readings and tarot and things. She offered to do my hands once, but I wouldn't have a bar of it. Mavis fortunately didn't follow in her mother's footsteps in that regard, which I'm thankful for. However, she was a lot more tolerant of, and had a lot better understanding of, those things than me. She thought about what I told her for a little while, and then she said, They're just going home. What do you mean? I asked. Those poor boys who drowned on the bar... You saw their spirits going home to say goodbye to their families. Bob said they came from Westport, that's where they're going. We were halfway between Greymouth and Westport. If any live person wanted to take the easiest, most direct way, they would have to go past us. As for the spirits of the dead, I wasn't so sure. All I can remember 40 years later is the way that nothing stopped them and the way that one bloke walked right through the great big tree stump as if it wasn't there. I told Mavis not to mention this incident to anyone. I had a reputation for being a bit pragmatic and straightforward, I suppose. I didn't want anyone thinking I was given to flights of fancy. Mavis might have mentioned it to her mother, I suspect she did, but no one else knew. A couple of days later, there was a piece in the newspaper on the wrecking of the Kestrel. There had been seven crew members on board all drowned and yes they all came from up Westport way they say animals can sense things on another level to us had old Ben known that these seven figures on the beach were not alive I guess we'll never know I had a funny feeling that after Mavis died she might appear for me she didn't perhaps because she died peacefully in bed in our home with me there holding her hand she didn't have to make her way home to the ones she loved because she was already there. This story occurred in a small east coast town on the North Island. Card playing is one of those binge type things people do. 
especially when the weather is bad there's nothing on the telly or you have the urge to have a bit of a gamble that's the way i looked at it anyway and so did a few of the others in the town it was midwinter raining like crazy and there was no outside work other than for the road gangs who were busy clearing slips quite a few of us were in forestry so there was nothing for us to do while the weather was so bad someone probably me thought it was about time the card school came out of hibernation. We had a big game about once every six months. There were smaller ones going all the time, but this was the school, and the whole district was in on it. Word quickly got around, and we did what we normally did, which was use the back room down the hall. At the appointed time of seven o'clock on a Friday night, we got the old potbelly stove glowing red hot, moved in some beers and a few bottles of coke, A couple of the women were jacked up to organise the kai, which is the food, and we were into it. The game was poker, straight stud, take no prisoners, no cash up and leave, this was last one standing, or sitting, winner takes all. We had six chairs and as one fell out there was always someone to step in. The spectators were four deep around the table. We played all through Friday night and four of the seats changed a couple of times. I was still in and sitting pretty and so was my mate George. There was a lot of money up. We used chips but the banker in charge was a non-player. Old Pete was the man. He sat at a small table to one side and issued chips when required. He had two shoeboxes, one for chips and the other full of money. And I mean full. Thursday had been payday at the works up the road and for the forestry boys. At the end of the game, Old Pete got 10% of the pot. That was fair, because he was also the arbitrator in any dispute, and his son Darby was the man who made sure that order was kept. Darby was a brisket puncher at the works, and he was built like the entire all-black front row rolled into one. He was gentle and quiet, but no one ever argued with him. We stopped every four hours or so for a break to stretch our legs and to have a bite. Typically, we played until we dropped, and if you went to sleep, you forfeited. I'd won a few over the years. You sure earned your money, especially when the game went on for the best part of a week, which it sometimes did. I've won with only $100 in chips against thousands. The other guy needed sleep so badly that in the end he just stumbled off to his bed, leaving me for the winner. It was pretty brutal, but we were all big boys and we knew what we were in for. We played right through to midday Saturday and then we were allowed an hour off. It wasn't enough time for a sleep but it was a chance to grab some fresh air and a sit down meal. Except that most of us stood to eat in order to give our bums a rest. I had my own cushion but even then the old behind got sore. Who's going to be a stayer? George asked me as I walked around the hall. It was still raining outside. All of them, I said. The team that was at the table now were old hands. Unless someone could clean house, we could conceivably still be playing on Monday. We settled into it again, the ranks of spectators rising and falling throughout the rest of the day. The All Blacks were playing Australia in the Bledisloe Cup that weekend, so things were thin about eight on Saturday night. One of the floating chairs had just tossed his hand in when at that moment a man none of us had ever seen before came in. He just walked in the door and straight to the empty seat. There were others waiting, but they all just stood there. No one complained because this guy was very weird looking. The stranger was like some character of a western. He was Maori, sure. Well, what we could see of him looked Maori. He wore a leather cowboy style hat and a big black leather coat, one of those long ones that goes right to the ground. The collar of the coat was half up. His nose was long and thin, his eyes were dark, his moustache was black and drooping at the corners, and he had a wide mouth with plenty of white teeth. Kiora, he said in a very deep voice. We all greeted him. He turned to Pete at the side of the table and handed him five new $100 notes. Pete gave him chips. I noticed that his hands and the fingers were very dark and very long. There were no names offered. Play started again and the stranger spoke only when necessary. By the time we stopped for our midnight break, it was obvious the newcomer was winning big time. 
I was getting down on chips and so was George and the other chairs had changed, one of them a couple of times. While the rest of us went to the toilet and wandered around having some kai, the stranger just sat at the table, his hands flat in front of him, waiting. Some of the spectators tried to talk to him to find out where he came from. Around was all he said and he just smiled. Well, we never made it to the next break. The stranger just cleaned us right out. It was like he just couldn't lose a hand. I went out completely gutted and George followed shortly afterwards. A couple of the floating chairs hung in there for a while and then it was all over. Pete and Darby collected all the chips. Pete counted the money and believe me, it was a decent amount. Pete then counted out his 10% while the stranger just sat, watching, with his eyes half hidden under the brim of his hat and this wide grin on his face. He took the big stack of money that Pete handed him and as he stood, he pushed it into a pocket in his long coat. A pleasure, gentlemen. He said in that deep, deep voice. We realised then just how tall he was. Maybe 6'4 or 6'5. Kiora, we said. And he was just going out the door when the hem of his coat flicked in the wind. I was one of about ten people whose eyes were drawn to his feet. I guess with the rest of his get-up we had expected some ornate cowboy boots. But in those few seconds as he stepped out the door... We all gaped at what we saw instead. Cloven hooves. We just stood there. The door closed and there was total silence. We stood blinking, open-mouthed. Then George leaped at the door and pulled it open. We all ran outside. The car park was empty but for our cars and trucks. No strange vehicles, no stranger. In a matter of seconds, he had gone. A couple of us ran to the corner of the building so we could see across the rugby fields towards the bush. Even on this stormy night, there was enough moonlight to see that there was no one there. He would have had to have been an Olympic sprinter to get across in the time it took for us all to get to the corner of the hall. We all went back inside and stood around the stove. We were tired and confused, I can tell you. Turehu, said old Pete finally. He was a Turehu. He came among us to play one of their tricks on us. The Turehu are a fairy people from Maori mythology who dwell in the forests of the North Island. In the south there is a different fairy tribe called the Mero Iro. To all intents and purposes the Turehu resemble humans but there is one notable difference. Cloven hooves. They are not satanic as you might think if you are of European heritage. The Turehu are the children of the mist in Maori mythology. Like the leprechauns of Ireland, they are often mischievous, given to play tricks on their human neighbours. The Mero Arrow of the South Island, while quite different in physical appearance to the Turehu, with hair-covered bodies and fewer human features, have the same sense of mischief. Everyone in this town is convinced that our card game was won by a Turehu. But what we are all wondering is what did he want with all that money? To go to the casino in Auckland, someone suggested. They'll never notice him as being any different from their usual customers. Some of the others are hoping the card-playing Turehu might come back for the next game so that they can have a go at getting their money back. To give some background information on the fairies, the Maori are descended from the Polynesian explorers who discovered Aotearoa around 800 years ago. They are the indigenous people of the land, or Tanata Venua. Stories passed down through their oral traditions reveal that when these explorers first arrived here, it was already occupied. According to oral traditions, the original occupants have many names, and depending on the location, have many descriptions. Commonly, they are known as the Patupairahe, but they are also sometimes referred to as Urukehu, or Tureu. When the Europeans first started settling here in the 19th century, they heard stories of these mysterious beings and they referred to them in English as fairies. However, they are nothing like the fairies you hear of in European folklore. A 1936 article from the newspaper Press wrote an extensive article titled New Zealand's Fairy Lore, which I will summarise here. <laughs> 
The Pachupaya Rehe are forest dwellers and different from human beings. They possessed supernatural powers and have commonly been described as fair-skinned with ruddy golden hair. Some have said they were of short stature, but others have described them as tall. They lived in shadowy forests and remote wooded peaks on high mountain ranges. Only on dark nights or dull misty days when fog and clouds hang around the hills and mountain tops did they roam about. They could be heard singing wailing sounds or playing the sweetest music ever heard on their flutes. They were said to be afraid of the fire of the mortals. Maori knew to keep their distance. It was said if a stranger were to enter Tapu, sacred, prohibited, set apart forests, and the Patupaya Rehe then detected their presence, they would play tricks on them. As a rule, though, they were shy and peace-loving, but occasionally they were known for capturing people, in particular, women. While today they are often dismissed as simple fairy stories and folklore, for many Maori, they were and are very real. Aotearoa, or New Zealand, sits amongst the Ring of Fire, which is a path along the Pacific Ocean characterised by active volcanoes and frequent earthquakes. Most eruptions and earthquakes take place along this path. The most recent deadly eruption occurred in December 2019 on White Island, killing 22 people, most of whom were tourists. This story begins in the eerie shadow of Mount Tarawera on the 31st of May 1886. In the 19th century, the tourist industry really started to boom here. The pink and white terraces located near Tarawera on the shores of Lake Rotomahana, was a popular tourist spot. It was reportedly the largest silica sinter deposit on Earth and was a natural wonder. Despite the eeriness of that morning, the accounts from eyewitnesses aboard a tourist vessel travelling to view the terraces were all clear and consistent. On board was the famous Maori guide Sophia, three other Maori women, six Maori rowers, and four Pakiha, which are white New Zealanders which included a doctor and a priest. Before they took off or even entered the boat, the water level rose swiftly, surrounding them, but then it subsided even more speedily. The Maori contingent reacted fiercely to this and refused to board. It took a lot of persuasion from the Pakeha group to get them to hop on. One of the rowers apparently said, Very well, we can die but once, so we will all go down together. It is important to note that Mount Tarawera was an age-old burial site, or Yurupa for Maori, and it had been declared tapu and not lightly approached. The only Pakeha woman on board, Mrs. Sisi, remembered Sophia murmur, I don't think I shall see the terraces again. After a white steam cloud was seen hovering over Tarawera. Later in a letter she wrote to her son, Mrs. Sisi said, After sailing for some time, we saw in the distance a large boat, looking glorious in the mist and the sunlight. It was full of Maori, some standing up, and it was near enough to me to see the sun glittering on the paddles. The boat was hailed, but returned no answer. We thought little of it at the time, that Dr. Ralph did not even turn to look, and until our return in the evening, we never gave it another thought. All those on board had no trouble making out this waka whose occupants were seated in a double row. Some were paddling, others were standing, wrapped in flax robes, heads bowed, and according to the Maori eyewitnesses, their hair was decorated as for death, with feathers of the huia and white heron. The Maori people on board the tourist boat were terrified as they believed these were the souls of the departed being ferried up the mountain of the dead. All local Maori knew there was no waka on the lake that day. In fact, no craft like the one seen had ever existed in the area. They knew the presence of this waka had only one meaning. It was an omen of disaster. Another tourist boat saw the same waka and passenger Josiah Martin sketched his impression of the image. Ten days later, on the 10th of June, Mount Tarawera erupted violently sending fire fountains into the sky and hot ash rained down on nearby settlements. Three villages were completely obliterated and 150 people lost their lives. The pink and white terraces were destroyed 
never to be seen again. So just to say before we do any discussion about this, Holly very helpfully sent uh, links to pronunciations of the various Maori words that were used in this set of stories. And like my mouth just sometimes won't make the sounds. And I, I did my best and I'm very sorry if the pronunciation of those words was wrong, but I, I tried. I tried very hard. I love these stories and you have absolutely inspired me to do an episode on New Zealand folklore. I know people have asked for it for years and I just, I guess I just never got around to it. But hearing these stories has, oh, it's just brilliant. And I'm definitely going to see if I can find a copy of that book where no birds sing because those stories were brilliant. I mean, first of all, we've got the story of the sailors going home and the dog recognizing that something is not right with this group of people walking down the beach. And you can only imagine this crazy storm whipping up loads of energy and then these presumably young men going to work having to go to work for whatever reason in this stormy weather and never coming home of course they're going to want to go home and just and say goodbye and in regard to the poker story i loved this story because we have versions of this story in ireland and there's definitely versions of this story in england about but we always refer to it as the devil coming to play a poker game and it's interesting that in Maori culture is the Turehu, so it's it's fairies, fairies coming to kind of be tricksters and be mischievous with people. And here I am using the word fairies when specifically they were just different entities that were living on the islands and the, the English word fairies was used to describe them. But they are nothing like fairies that you hear of in our in our versions of folklore. I will say in regards to the last story about the, the phantom canoe if native indigenous local people say i feel like this this trip is not a good idea for these reasons i feel like whatever has just happened the water rising and falling very quickly is a sign you listen to those people okay just listen to those people Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Thank you to Donna and Holly for sending in your stories. Remember, the last story came from December the 13th, 2023. And if you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash reallifeghoststories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely and free and on that note i shall see you next time